you guys are going to listen to me talk about camera two. So just a quick show of hands, who's an Android type person in the room? Awesome. And how many people have done stuff with camera, the camera API? Okay, cool. So I've actually done a few talks on the camera API before, and usually what I, I love doing is deep dives. You know, I love looking at code, I love taking people through examples and saying, well, you know, here's the ins and outs, here's like stuff that messed me up, and here's some, you know, things that worked for me. And, you know, uh, Camera 2 was kind of announced as part of Lollipop sometime last year, and, and I got really excited, you know, when they talked about, you know, Camera 2, they kind of talked about all these improvements they made. And, and if you've ever done anything with hardware, you know that sometimes it's not quite so easy, you know, sometimes the APIs aren't perfect, sometimes you have to deal with quirky hardware, so any improvement always sounds like a good thing, right? And actually the last talk that I gave, you know, I actually had a little mini section where I had kind of read up on all the cool things that we're going to look forward to in camera two. And I had this whole bit where I went, this camera, the future of camera is going to be amazing, you know, we're going to have these more efficient and more powerful APIs, it's going to be so good. And, you know, I was thinking about this talk and I was like, well, I should do a deep dive like I always do and we'll just dig down and do a new application and just play with all this new cool stuff. Well, I actually sat down with the Camera 2 API, and instead of it being, well, it was amazing, but it was also more like this. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on to your butts, because a Camera API 2 is a big improvement, but it's also incredibly more challenging. It's, it takes a lot more work, and what I found is that when I actually jumped into it, it was basically very little like the experience that I had before. So what I found that really helped me was reading the documentation. And it wasn't even just the camera API 2 documentation. I ended up researching the graphics architecture. I ended up looking at the actual hardware layers that lived between the Java framework, the Android framework, and the underlying camera drivers. And that's when it actually clicked. And instead of doing a deep dive today, what I want to give you guys is a high level I guess, introduction to the changes between camera 1 camera, and camera 2 and explain to you why you know things are changing, why things are so different, and why it is better, it's just harder. And I think the thing that you know, will benefit anyone trying to dive into this is just understanding the underlying mechanics and understanding the motivations of the change, um, more than just you know taking you through some code. Because honestly, I'd have you guys here for three hours and you'd probably you know, either get sleepy or starve or get mad at me. So <laughs> we're gonna keep this high level and try to kind of get you on the right foot to doing uh, API too. So, Oh wait, sorry, but this was me after about a day of camera two before reading the documentation. So um, I, I'm not trying to scare you off. Just to be honest, you know, it's it's a lot different. And if you've done anything with camera camera one, this is going to be quite a different show. So I do want to take you through a quick comparison of camera one and camera two, and talk about the distinct differences that you know between the two APIs. I'm going to talk about the underlying changes in what is known as the hardware abstraction layer that is basically the foundation for the new uh, API. And we're going to talk about how you actually get started building an, an, an application with the new API. I'm going to run you through a uh, very high level the steps to actually capture an image. And even though that sounds like not a big deal, it actually has become a really big deal. And then hopefully um, if I don't keep you guys here too long, we'll wrap things up and have time for a few questions before the awesome raffle. All right, so just a little bit about me. I'm an independent contractor. I'm a native Android and iOS developer living and working out of Denver, um, although I am originally from the DC metro area. I graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in computer engineering, and the only thing I do other than develop is game. I live a very computer-centric life with not a lot of sunlight. So, camera one versus camera two. Uh, when I think about the difference between camera one and camera two, I actually came up with this really cool analogy last week where, you know, if you think about camera one, it's really like a point and shoot camera, right? It's really simple, but it's easy to get started. It has a decent amount of functionality, but it's not too advanced. You might not get the greatest performance, you might not get the greatest quality images, but it's really easy to use, it's straightforward, and, you know, it's pretty good for the average consumer, you know, the average developer. Camera two is more like a DSLR camera. It's a lot, the learning curve is a lot steeper. Uh, there are a lot more knobs to toggle and, uh, and adjustments to make. The language you use when you talk about things on a DSLR is a lot higher level than you would talk about a point and shoot. Uh, but overall, you have more capabilities. You have more control. You have higher quality and higher performance. And you have a lot more room to mess up. You know, you have to really know what you're doing. You have to understand kind of the mechanics, the underlying mechanics of the camera to really get the most use out of it. 
And that's pretty much exactly what the situation is with one versus two. One, it was pretty easy to get started. The language, the actual method names are very straightforward, whereas camera two is a lot more advanced. You kind of have to know where things are and what you're doing ahead of time. There's not a lot of jumping in and getting your fingers in there and hoping that a picture pops out. You kind of have to be a little bit more prepared. So, so the, the main difference that comes out of camera one and camera two is due to the hardware abstraction layer. Now the hardware abstraction layer, layer are these kind of intermediary pieces between the Android framework and the underlying uh, camera drivers. So it's basically an interface that allows that dri the, the camera driver and the Android framework to, uh, to communicate. So in camera version one, it was really simple. It was basically a black box. As far as you know, you, your application and the Java or the Android framework was concerned, you just send some requests. Maybe you want like a camera preview, you know, like the, the low res video you can use as a viewfinder. You might want a picture, you might want a video. You just send the request to this black box and at some point later, some image data and some metadata pop up and that's pretty much it. I've heard it described as like a one-way system just because basically requests in, results out. And, and that was it. Um, now, it formed that, that's the basis of the Camera One API. And you know, again, it's straightforward, it's simple. Because it is a black box, there's not a lot for you to kind of get, in your, get, your, get your hands in and mess with. And it, you know, it, works, it, it works, but there are some problems and limitations. Uh, again, because it's a black box, uh, because you don't have any kind of idea or notion or control of the underlying camera system, there's only so much you can do with it. But that's not to say that camera one is useless. There's a lot that you can do. There's a lot of settings. There's a lot of parameters that you could change when capturing image data. But it was a bit limited and kind of like the biggest deal, I guess, or the biggest limitation is that the camera one subsystem, and, and the subsystem is kind of like all those layers from like the Android framework down to the device or the camera driver, and that entire subsystem is basically centered around three modes. So you have three modes of operation. You have preview mode, you have still capture, you know, just pictures, and you had video capture, and that was it. And basically that, that black box was locked into one of those three modes. So it, so it basically became very difficult to add any new functionality or add or, or give the developer and ultimately the user more control. So a big example that people kind of were ooing about when Camera 2 came out was this idea of finally getting burst mode. Now, burst mode is this idea that you, know, you want the camera to take a certain number of requests or take a certain number of images in a short amount of time. Now, if you think about the three modes that we had with camera one, you know, preview, still, and video, I mean, if you think about still, you're taking you know, a single you know, static image. Video is more like taking a continuous stream of static images, right? Now, burst mode, like I said, is like taking X number of pictures in a short amount of time. And that doesn't really fit into either still capture or video mode, you know, it's something in between. And because that black box, that camera one was locked into those three modes, you weren't able to get burst mode out from any API, you know, updates or anything. So again, the limitations. And also, you know, again, if you had a camera that, that you could give the user manual focus or manual exposure, because of the nature of the underlying hardware abstraction layer, you couldn't actually let them get a hold of it. So in order to then get to kind of get past this, there were some big changes. So instead of just changing the API, you know, this is not just adding new features to the existing API, this is an entire rework of those middle layers, that hardware abstraction layer, that interface between you know, camera drivers and the Android framework has been completely redone. So they've basically broken that black box open and given you a lot more of a detailed view of what's actually going on inside. And so, I've always, so, I, so I keep saying, you know, camera two is not an update so much as a complete rework, okay? It's based on an actual update to the hardware abstraction layer, so it's not like you can just download it to your phone and, and get the new HAL. You know, it has to be kind of something done by the, on the manufacturer side. And because it's such a huge change, it, it's actually a deprecation of camera one. So, so that's kind of good news and bad news because good news is we're going to get a lot more functionality, but bad news is you're actually going to have to deal with the camera 2 API if you want to do camera applications. So, okay, I, I'm being a little bit negative, but what are the good things that are coming out of this? Well, you're going to get a lot more control over that subsystem. You know, if the camera does support manual focus, if the camera does support uh, post-processing, which is like all those little algorithms that do color correction and sharpening and, and all that kind of stuff, you can actually kind of adjust those things as a developer. Uh, some more kind of cool things is more capabilities. You can have raw support. You can have, you know, um, well, you had face detection before, but you have like, you know, a lot more ability to kind of pick up 
some of the really cool cam camera features. And overall, it makes it actually is making the API more efficient and more maintainable. So again, kind of going back to that example of burst mode, you know, we're not limited by these three, you know, specific modes. We now have a lot more flexibility because you know everything is done in a little bit more of a generalized way. We can kind of extend it in a lot, uh, a lot easier. Okay, so for simplicity, I will no longer say hardware abstraction layer. I'm just going to call it how. So camera two is built on version three of how. So how how three, and instead of having these three static modes, preview, still, and video. Everything's been flattened out into kind of a very consistent single uh, request system. And basically, instead of talking in really high level terms like preview, picture, video, you're going to talk about frame requests and frame captures. So basically, anything that you do, you need to translate it, you need to think about it in terms of frame captures. So, as I mentioned before, taking a still picture is just grabbing a frame of data. Grabbing a video is now going to become a repeating request for frames of data. I mean, that's, how, that's what a video is, basically, you know, a whole bunch of still pictures jammed together. And um, so the language is a little bit different. Instead of having the camera API say, start preview, capture picture, you're going to be talking about capture, capture burst, repeating capture, repeating burst. So that's, that's kind of like the difference here, the, uh, speaking about image capture in a different way. Now, one of the really cool things that has changed in this new hardware extraction layer is that you know, we, we're kind of taking things more low level, right? We're not talking about video, not talking about pictures, we're talking about frames. Now, the really cool thing is, is that with that kind of low levelness, we got some perks. Like now, when you make a request for that single frame of data, you can actually request that that data be sent out to multiple outputs. So you could have like a surface that's rendering, you know, the image on in your application. You could have like an image reader that you can save JPEG data to and save it to a file. You can even have what's uh, an allocation class, which basically can send image data right to render script, and or a media encoder if you want to do video. So and you can actually do all of that. You can actually send that same image data to multiple, you know, outputs, all these kind of different places, targets for your data. You can do that with a single frame request. And so basically, when you make a request for that data, you can specify one to n, and I think it's somewhere between three and five. Uh, I think it's limited by performance. But um, yeah, so you can make a single request and get out a whole bunch of different um, versions, I guess, of that data. All right, so another big change with HAL 3 and Camera 2 is metadata. So when you're talking about photography, when you're talking about doing advanced features, metadata is actually really, really important. You know, before with Camera One, you got metadata back, but it was pretty, you know, simplistic. You know, time picture was taken, some kind of basic information, you know, maybe location, maybe this, maybe that. Um, but now, <coughs> metadata is kind of basically just um, is propagated throughout the entire, you know, uh, half. So every time you make a request, every time you get a result back for that request, it is chock full of metadata. And so one of the big things is that the camera characteristics, the 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 basically um, uh, features of that camera, like the sensor, like the lens, you will get information about all of that now. Uh, you'll still get uh, frame, the kind of information about each frame, you know, timestamp and, and certain statistics that get generated when a frame is captured, you'll get all that back now. And just kind of overall, whenever you make a request and whenever you get that request back, you'll get all the data about it. In fact, when you make a request and the result comes back, you don't just get the image data. You'll get your original request, so you'll know exactly what you asked for, and then you'll get the actual configuration of the camera at the time that that image was captured. So you'll know what you put in, you know what you, put, you, you got out, and you'll have the image data that goes with that. So really cool. Now, having data is not just good for the sake of having data, but <coughs> metadata and you know, more complex, more uh, detailed metadata is required for certain features. So think about HDR, right? HDR is this process where you take a bunch of pictures at different exposures and you combine them to create a higher quality image. Well, that whole process is based on something called exposure bracketing, which is basically you take the same picture at different exposure you know, levels and you have a certain amount that you're you know, increasing or decreasing the exposure by. It's really important for you to know what the exact exposure that each image is taken at. So again, that's where that detail, that accurate metadata comes into play. Uh, another, another feature that's really reliant on metadata is raw support. Uh, being able to generate raw files depends very much on having the correct sensor information, and we have that now. So, again, metadata, metadata, metadata. Very important, and, and again, we have a lot of it now. So here's kind of a graphic to kind of compare with like the earlier image I showed you of camera one uh, being very simple, you know, being a black box. Now you can kind of see 
a little bit more what's going on now. So instead of, again, start, uh, start preview, take picture, capture video, we have the capture request up in the left corner. Here. And like I mentioned before, you can give you know, very specific settings for a frame. You can specify multiple targets where all that image data is going to go. And you feed that into the camera device, which eventually feeds it into the camera hardware. And then once you know, the camera captures that image and does some processing and splits it out into the different you know, output uh, buffers, It'll send it to all these surfaces here. So at some point, you've probably set up some surfaces to uh, take that data in and either render it or save it or something. So whenever that uh, request actually makes it through the camera hardware, you're going to get that image data directly into your surfaces. And as I mentioned before, with all that metadata, along with the image data uh, from that request in your surfaces, you're also, you're also going to get a capture result. And that capture result contains both the original capture info or your original capture request with all those configurations that you asked for, as well as the actual final configuration at capture time. So, but again, it's a lot more of an open view, and you get uh, a lot more of an open view, and it also gives you uh, more of a chance to kind of get your hands in there. So another big change with HAL three, uh, and I said it's again, it's breaking open this black box. It's actually exposing the camera pipeline. So when you're taking a digital image. It's not just kind of like one action. It's a series, it's a process, right? A lot of stuff is happening. You know, there's gonna be data captured in from the sensor. That data is gonna be taken in, you know, processed. And like I said, like I mentioned before, there's gonna be maybe some color correction, there's gonna be some edge sharpening, there's gonna be a lot of other processing that happens with that data. And then after you take it, you know, um, that data has to be scaled and cropped. Because you know, usually you think about digital camera, you can actually request, you know, what size it saves pictures in. So there are units in the camera process to take care of that. So what HAL3 actually did is to expose the pipeline to the framework and also to the uh, kind of on, on the hardware side. And so this is cool in two ways. It's cool for us developers because now we can actually send triggers into the pipeline. And as I mentioned, you know, camera two, you actually can kind of adjust and tweak all these, uh, process, all these uh, post-processing. You can, uh, um, you know, specify different kinds of scaling and cropping, and again, different kinds of encodings. You know, JPEG. You can get raw data now. Uh, you can get even uh, YUV data if you're a video type person. And uh, on the manufacturer side, it actually is cool for them as well because each of these each of these stages in the pipeline is its own component. So a manufacturer can actually swap out any of these components for their own implementations, meaning that they can pick out the algorithm or the component that works best for that hardware. So it's really cool from their side because they can make you know, their camera hardware implementations as efficient and you know, high quality as possible. And from our side, we get to actually reach in here and mess with stuff. So pretty cool stuff. <coughs> All right. So I kind of blathered on to you a bit about the hardware. So let's take a flip over uh, to the developer side and see what we got. So I always like to start out talking about developing camera, camera applications with what I call the Stones Principle. And the Stones Principle is this. You can't always get what you want. <laughs> but if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. And as Android developers, you know, we deal every single day with you know, what API do I want to support, what features does it have, and what, is, what do I want my user to be able to have access to? So the idea of the Stones Principle is um, kind of magnified when you're talking about hardware. You know, like, you know, we deal every day with, well, one user is running gingerbread, poor fool, and one user is running jelly bean, and I've got this and I've got that. Well, when you work with hardware, the hardware becomes just another element you have to worry about. I mean, you could have two phones running, running Lollipop, and one has a really awesome camera that has manual focus and manual post processing, and another one might have lollipop, but the crappiest camera in the world. And so, so their capabilities are completely different, even though they're on the same API. So it's really important when you do a camera application to really kind of plan out ahead of time what are your critical features and what are your optional features. And the framework provides you tools to be able to, you know, uh, filter out your application on Google Play. To only, those feet, to only those users that have those things that you really, really need. And at the same time, for those things that you would like to have but you don't necessarily, you know, have, to, they're necessarily required for your application to be checked at runtime. And you can, you know, alter your logic, you can hide features or do whatever you need to for different users. So on the need side, uh, as I mentioned before, we're mostly talking about Google Play filtering and kind of working with that manifest. And again, Kind of usually the first decision you make is what minimum, what's my minimum SDK? 
And then on top of that, there's actually the users features tag. And this is actually really important with cameras because there's a lot of different ca uh, features, hardware features that a camera, that one person's camera might have and another, per another person's camera might not have. <laughs> so again, it's really important to use these um, to determine you know, mission critical features in your application. Now for things that are not so mission critical that you could live without, there are a lot of things that you can do to check at runtime. Now, something that you know, we, we probably have used before is the build.version ver build uh, value. You can basically check, you know, oh, what API is my user on? Oh, okay, so they might have face detection, they might not, so don't show them this part of the UI, don't you know, show them this part of the UI instead. There's also the package manager. Now, the package manager it works a bit off of the same features that use features does. It usually, usually use that to, say, check at runtime if your user has a flash, if the user has autofocus. Uh, so that's what the package manager is for. Now you can also query the camera APIs themselves for kind of information on maybe what kind of settings the camera has, like uh, color mode, right? You can ask the camera, hey, do you have sepia? Do you have black and white? Or do you have like flash on, flash off ability and stuff like that? And so in camera one, we had this object called camera parameters. Now camera parameters actually was doing double duty. It's a way for you to determine, you know, what kind of settings you can um, adjust on the camera. And it's also a way to actually kind of um, set those settings uh, when you're actually capturing an image. Now in camera two, we have something different. It's called camera characteristics. Now camera char characteristics is actually really powerful. It, it contains not just camera parameters, but also all that really cool, really detailed information about the camera itself. So sensor information, lens information, all of that you can pull from camera characteristics. So, But again, it's really important, especially with camera applications, to really know what you're getting into, know what you really need, and know what you want, but you you know, can live without. All right, so I just talked a lot about what, what, uh, what, your, what your user's device might support and what it might not support. And so a new concept in the Camera 2 API is this supported hardware level. So there are three supported hardware levels, and we'll go from the top down. So basically this is just an indication of features that you'll be able to have access to, as well as performance constraints. Now, the, the, t the first level is full, and as it might sound from the name, it basically guarantees you a certain set of really advanced features. And this will include manual focus, it will include uh, manual post-processing, so all those cool little algorithms, um, the ability to tweak those things. There's also performance constraints, so you, know, you have to keep, uh, I think, and the documentation has a, little, a lot better explanation of it, but there are certain performance constraints for something running HAL 3. So again, that's all kind of indicated by you know, the full, that you're kind of running you know, all, the cool all the cool features and running them in a performant way. So the next level down is limited. Now, limited cameras will be running HAL 3 just like full, but they're not necessarily guaranteed to have all those cool features that full has. And then finally, there's legacy. Now, legacy, so, so if you're at legacy, that basically means that you have a camera that's not at HAL 3, it's probably HAL 1 or HAL 2. But you're still able to use the Camera 2 API, probably because you're running Lollipop. But the Camera 2 API is more of a wrapper around the old camera stuff. So you're basically guaranteed not to have any of the cool new stuff. And you're also, at the same time, have more relaxed performance constraints because you're not on that new hardware abstraction layer. And again, for a much better and more articulate explanation of all those things, you can go to the documentation. It's, it's pretty good. All right. so. Android application, start off with the manifest. So there are some pretty imp important features uh, in the manifest to use when you're doing a camera. First, you actually have to ask permission to use the camera because it is a hardware feature. And the kind of tricky thing to note is that if you just drop in the camera permission, it is going to implicitly require that your users have a back camera, a front, front camera, autofocus, and flash. So if you are, have done any camera or one work, you know the documentation tends to yell at you and say, look, you really need to use users' features, okay? You know, like, we're, we're gonna expect these things. If you don't tell us you don't need them, then, you know, you, you need to kind of spell it out with the users' features. So just something to keep be aware of. So there are a few more manifest uh, values that might be interesting to you. So you can be a little more relaxed with your requirements. If your application just needs a back or front camera, but neither one specifically, you can just say that, well, my user just has, has to have any camera. Uh, you can do that. You can actually specify that your camera must support external devices. And this is pretty new, it's API 20. And then there are three new values that are very specific to camera two. And again, these are the fancy new sexy features, manual post-processing, manual sensor, 
And then there's actually a manifest value. If you want to make sure that your users are on only full, you can go ahead and put that in your manifest. Oh, uh, and so when I looked about a month and a half ago, the only phones that I could find that definitely had full support were the Nexus 5 and Nexus 6. I believe that there are some newer HTC devices that do have limited, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how it is. It might have changed a little bit by now, but be aware when you're doing camera two, it is new and it is got a hardware component to it. So it's not gonna, again, like I kind of mentioned before, it's not like you can just drop in the new HAL and have a sexy, fully capable camera. Okay, so I wanted to keep this talk really high level because to be honest with you, the code examples and the process of starting a preview and capturing an image with camera two is horribly complex. So there are two examples. <laughs> there's, I'm sorry, I'm just scaring everybody off tonight. <laughs> so there's two examples on the Google Samples GitHub um, that are actually you know, pretty decent and basically give you a basic application that you can see um, how to actually use the camera two API. The first one is the camera two basic example, and it's pretty simple. You know, you look for the cameras on the device, you pick one out, you open it up, start the preview, take some pictures with it, and save some pictures to file. Uh, there's another example that actually shows you raw. So if you've been waiting for raw support, uh, that's the uh, example project for you. It uh, does raw, but it also does some crazy things like trying to handle multiple uh, really kind of close, close together requests. And uh, also, it does actually a lot better job at concurrency. So a big thing with camera two is the idea that you know we're we have a more advanced system, it's pipelined, it's performant, requests to the camera should be non-blocking. So a lot of the camera two API calls have hooks into the, or parameters rather where you can put in a handler to a background thread and run a lot of these hardware grabbing, hardware manipulating uh, methods in the background. And that's great, <coughs> you should do it, but that also means you have to start paying a lot more attention to concurrency. You know, the camera API was really simple. There wasn't a lot, you know, there, there wasn't any kind of built-in method for, you know, putting stuff in the background. Now you have it, you should use it, but now that means you have to think more about concurrency. And camera two raw, to be honest with you, I think is a lot better example and has a lot more, uh, I guess, better use of concurrency techniques with the new camera two API. So definitely something to look at. I would go camera basic two first, just so you don't go crazy, so you can get a good idea of how it works, and then you can move on to the actual correct way to do things. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna get, uh, just kind of tell you some of the new classes, some of the new, your new best friends when you're working with camera. And so you're gonna have the camera manager, camera manager is a system service, and his job is pretty much mostly to give you information about what cameras you have, and to actually give you possession or give you control of one of these cameras. And he'll also provide you with that camera correct characteristics, so that class that has all that detailed information about your camera and its capabilities. That's what he's for. So, you, and again, you'll have the camera characteristics class that has all that cool information. And then you have a new camera device class. And this camera device class is basically your handle onto a device camera. And you're gonna do a lot of work with him. You're going to set up uh, capture requests with him and you're gonna set up this new thing called camera capture session. Now, if you've worked with camera one at all, you know that normally what you do is you just open up a camera and you just do stuff to it. You know, camera, take a picture. Camera, autofocus. You know, everything is done through that kind of handle, camera handle class. Now that there's, now there's kind of an intermediary guy. There's this camera capture session. Now, you know, before with how, you know, I mentioned before with HAL 3, you're ha you have the ability to, with each request, send that image data out to multiple outputs. Now, setting up the output, configuring them to receive that image data takes a bit of work. So it's actually the camera capture session's job to uh, take some pre-configured outputs, uh, services, you know, like uh, image reader, media encoder, whatever, and actually associate them with a particular camera device and get those guys set up to work together. Uh, you can't take pictures without this guy, and uh, again, he's kind of a new kind of middleman in the process. Uh, but basically, you he'll he'll again associate surfaces with the camera device, and he's actually the gateway for requests. So while you may actually make a request, you know, in conjunction with the camera device. The camera capture session is the actual guy who will take that request and send it off to the camera. Okay, so again, metadata. So uh, there's a camera metadata class and it has a lot of information in it. Uh, the camera characteristics are kind of done in like a map style where you have a key for each piece of information and a particular you know, value uh, of some type that comes out. 
Uh, camera metadata has a lot of that basic information about what keys and what key values you have there. So um, I mentioned this before, but the new camera request and capture result objects are actually uh, subclasses of the camera metadata. And again, that's going along with the same idea that you know, we always want to know, you know what we're requesting and what we're getting back. So camera requests are tied very particularly to a camera device. And uh, uh, when you have your camera capture session, right? So he's holding on to all the possible places that your image data could go. So what happens is when you make a re camera request, you have to say, all right, I'm working with that particular camera device and I want that particular service that I talked about earlier. Those two are gonna go together uh, to the camera. So again, it ha everything is really tightly coupled uh, you have to have a very specific set of surfaces. You have to have, like, you know, let the camera kind of hook up to them through the camera session, and you have to make sure that you only pick out one of those guys to send into the request. Uh, if you don't, bad stuff happens. Usually, it's just not a picture showing up, but you know, bad stuff can happen. Um, and those are the classes uh, that you'll be working with in camera two. So I'm going to give you a really quick outline of what a application might look like. Uh, in camera two, and it's actually it's pretty similar to camera one. So the first thing you have to do is find the cameras on the device, and you'll use camera manager for that. You pick up a camera, and you'll open it, and so you'll get that camera device guy, that you know handle onto that camera. And generally, what you're going to do uh, separately is you know figure out what outputs you want, you know image reader, render script allocation, whatever. You're going to set those guys up, and you're going to pass both the camera device and those outputs to a camera capture session. Once that guy is open, you can start making requests and sending them into the session and getting results back. And that's pretty much it. If you want to continue making capture requests, you just keep making new ones, sending them to the camera session. If you switch cameras, because all this middle guy stuff, because the camera capture session, because the capture requests are very specific to a camera device, if you switch cameras, you kind of have to go all the way back to step two, step three, and reset all of that up. Now the caveat here is that setting up the camera capture session takes relatively a long time. So you should be judicious about doing it and not, you know, suddenly flip back between this camera and that. Uh, so just be cognizant of that. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is a great, believe it or not, it's a great diagram basically showing you all that stuff I talked about and relating the new camera API with you know the workings of the camera device here. Uh, I will not put you through the torture of pointing out every single little piece of detail on this diagram and, and explaining it, but uh, if you're interested, it's, this is actually in the documentation for the hardware abstraction layer. Uh, again, you can just kind of quickly see you know, all the possible destinations you have that you can send image data to. Uh, you have the lists of the different API method calls and you know, where they go and where they come from. <laughs> Uh, caveat though that this is an old diagram, so some of the methods have changed, although the soul remains the same. Uh, but yeah, that's basically, again, you know, we've kind of gotten away from the safe zone of that black box, we've gotten into this mess, but I will tell you that it is more powerful and it is more flexible, and it is, you know, for the time being, the future of the camera. So if you're sitting camera, this is what your life is going to look like. <laughs> it's pretty though, you know, all the colors and stuff and all the lines, so, you know, but it's, it is powerful and it is Okay, so please don't read every single word on this slide. Uh, what I want to do is kind of compare to you, and again, reinforce the fact that, you know, the camera one was really user-friendly. It's a point-and-shoot camera, you just pick it up and go. Camera two takes a bit of work. Now, on the left here, I actually have, you know, different operations you might do with a camera, and on, and on the first column, I have the camera one calls that you generally would make to do these things. And on the right is the camera two API calls you would do for the same tasks. So, I mean, they're pretty, you know, comparable. Opening the cameras, not too bad. Starting a setup mostly involves kind of taking care of that surface view, whatever, in your hierarchy that's actually rendering that preview. Now, actually starting the preview. So in camera one, you had it really easy. You have a surface holder, which is basically a handle to some surface that's rendering on your, on your UI, and you give that to the camera. And you said, here, here's where you're gonna draw the preview. And then you say, okay, camera, start the preview. And that's it, two method calls. Here's camera two. <laughs> you have to start a capture session. You have to create a capture request. You have to specify the target for that request, you know, whatever surface that is. You have to set up the preview request. And you know, there is a certain value that you have to give it because the preview is usually kind of more low-res video than like a regular video capture. There's certain uh, settings you want to do for autofocus and auto exposure so that you know the preview is usable. And then you actually have to 
take all that and wrap it up into a request, then you have to actually say, instead of just saying start preview, because you're asking for a continuous request of the image data, instead of just saying, okay, start preview, you have to say set repeating request. So you have to know uh, that you're not just asking for a single frame of data, you're asking for a continuous stream of data. And again, it's not just that it's more verbose, but there's a whole bunch of other things to worry about. All these little methods that I kind of marked with the star and the cross, these are all methods that are both asynchronous, but that also have the ability to be backgrounded, or rather they just have a parameter where you can give a handler to some background bit. So, you know, on this side, everything is pretty much either synchronous or just a really straightforward callback. On this side, it's a lot more work. Uh, it's, more, it's more efficient. It um, needs you a lot more control. But you really have to know the very specific set of sequence, or the specific sequence of events that you need to make happen for you the preview to actually show up. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little more high level about what you would be doing if you're actually you know, starting your camera application. So starting a camera application or starting up a preview or capturing an image in your camera application with Android was never really a linear process. There was a lot of things that dance together that you have to coordinate. So from a high level, if you're just setting up the camera and trying to get you know, the preview showing up on your screen, there's a bunch of things that you kind of do at the same time and then kind of coordinate into, you know, like a, the final reveal of the preview on the screen. So usually what you'll have is you'll have some view in your view, or some view in your hierarchy that is meant to be the place where the preview shows up. And you have to actually wait for that view to generate that surface where the image data actually gets rendered. And that's going to be an asynchronous callback. So you have to kind of put it in your layout and make sure that you wait until the surface is done before you do anything with it. Otherwise, bad things happen. So on the camera side, you will be wanting to figure out what cameras you have and actually you know, ask the camera manager for information on that camera. And at, at some point, you're going to want to open that camera to get that camera device, which is you know, your handle onto that camera. And that is also an asynchronous call, so you have to wait for that to open. At the same time, you're going to want to get more information out of camera manager and camera characteristics. So when you start a preview, you can't just say, oh, here's like a 1800 by something something surface, go ahead and go crazy and draw. There's actually very specific preview sizes that you have to set um, on that surface in order for that to render correctly. So you don't just have to create the surface and wait for it to be done. You have to grab out the camera info, figure out what size is, is uh, correct or allowed, and then basically reconfigure the surface to match that size. And once you have that done, your surfaces are configured. Then you have to wait for the camera to open and be ready. And then once you have all those things together, then you can actually start a camera capture session and then start the preview. So it's a dance, basically. There's a lot of things that could be happening at once, and you have to make sure that you finish all the configuration and then bring everything together at the right time. And this was kind of true in camera one. Camera one was more kind of like the right half of the screen, and camera two is kind of added more of like the left half of the screen. <laughs> all right, so actually taking a picture. So, camera one, yeah. autofocus, take picture, wait for picture to come back. <laughs> camera two, sorry. <laughs> so, first, uh, so basically what happens is, is that instead of having everything in that black box and taking care of you, you have to know exactly what sequence uh, to trigger things and, and, and for things to happen. So, before you just say, all right, camera, autofocus for me. Uh, now you actually have to kind of hook into that pipeline and send out triggers and say, hey, trigger the autofocus. And you have to actually wait for that autofocus to lock. And unfortunately, you don't exactly have a really straightforward callback like you had in camera one. What you do is you get this result, uh, this kind of result received type callback. And what you do is actually check the state of the autofocus algorithm and say, hey, autofocus, are you locked? And you're like, nah, not yet. All right, cool, I'm gonna wait for the next result. And, and usually what happens is when you do a camera request, you won't just get back one result when it's done. You'll get back a lot of in progress results. So what you have to do is keep checking and say, hey, you know, autofocus, are you done yet? Okay, cool, you're locked, what next? All right, so usually when you take a picture, you do autofocus and you also have auto exposure. Now, auto exposure in camera one is basically kind of up in that black box, you know, you don't have to worry about it, just turn it on or turn it off. For camera two, you actually need to trigger what is called pre-capture. Now, when a camera goes through its auto exposure algorithm, it actually has to do what's called metering. So that's kind of like reading the light levels and determining you know, like the good values to get you know, good picture uh, out of you know, those settings. 
So what's going to happen is for you to take a picture, you actually need to say, hey, camera, can you start that pre-capture process where you do all that cool, fancy reading the light stuff? And it's going to do that. And basically what's going to happen is you're going to wait for you know, some kind of in-progress results and say, hey, has the exposure settings converged? And that's actually the name of the status, converge. And he might say, no, no, I'm still working. He's like, OK, OK, next capture result. Are you done yet? No? Oh, okay, okay. All right. Uh, how about now? Oh, yeah, I'm converged. All right. So once you have the auto exposure converged, then you can actually go and start a different request for actual still capture. And you create that request, you know, set a bunch of features on it, you know, oh, I want it to be a tone, and I want you to, you know, have this white balance, and I want this, and make sure you get some face detection in there, too. So once you get all those set up, you create the request, you send it into the capture session, and you wait for that capture request to complete. But you are not done. Because in the process of actually setting, sending that capture request um, to the session, you had to stop the previous preview, you know, that repeating quest for the pre preview. You actually had to call stop at some point, I think, low there. And now that you're done, you have to start it up again. So you're going to send another request where you basically reset all the values in the preview, send it to the camera session, and it'll restart the preview for you. And you're ready for round two, or you're ready for a nap. So, um, but that's basically it, and you can, as you can see, a lot more powerful, and you know, if you think about it, that actually is pretty cool that you can reach into the camera pipeline and mess with the auto exposure and mess with the autofocus and, you know, kind of, you know, be able to have a hand in that. It's a lot harder uh, between one and two, but again, the trade-off is you get a lot more power, a lot more control, um, and be able to do cool things if you know what you're doing. All right, uh, just really quick, a few caveats. So. Some camera two caveats. Uh, and this is kind of just number one rule. It was there in camera one, it's here for camera two, is that basically whenever you grab a camera device, you have control of that camera resource. No one else can get a hold of it. So please be polite and only pick it up when you need it and let go of it immediately when you don't need it anymore. If you monopolize the camera, you could crash other apps, and that's just rude. So again, uh, please, you know, uh, again, only acquire uh, camera boosters when you need them. And the best place to do that is basically just pick it up and on resume and then drop it or release it in on pause. And also when you're switching cameras, please try not to pick up you know, all the camera resources at once. If you're switching from, let's say, the front to the back camera, just close whatever one you're not using. Uh, another caveat is, I kind of mentioned it before is what I like to call the surface dance. The setting up of the surface is really an independent kind of process from the actual camera. So just make sure that you are aware of that um, aware of you know what state the surface is in that you're rendering to, and make sure that you know it's done before you actually start trying to mess with it. Uh, again, bad things will happen. Um, and also, just uh, kind of a mistake that's easy to make is that you kind of set things up, and you might have an invalid value in there. A lot of times, when you give to the preview a size it doesn't like, it'll usually just fail or just not show anything. So you have to be make sure that whenever you render a surface, you check, oh, what kind of sizes are OK for you? So you, just make sure you have to check those. Um, a lot of the information is in this wonderfully named uh, key value entry called the scalar stream configuration map. Before, you just called the get preview output sizes. Oh, OK, well, that makes sense. Now you actually have to read the documentation and figure out what all this stuff means. So um, that's a little hint, because it took me a little while to figure that one out. And camera two caveats about concurrency. And as you can tell, I love alliteration. Um, so camera two, how three. So a lot of the point of this whole reworking is performance. And again, like as we saw kind of in earlier slides, and as you will see, as you work with camera two, there's a lot of focus on asynchronous work. You know, there's callbacks everywhere. And again, you will have these parameters where you can feed it a handler to a background thread. So you can do all this kind of long running, you know, how, you know a hog worthy, um, camera operations on a background thread. Uh, but you know, when you do that kind of stuff, you have to be careful. Um, you want to make sure that the camera operations stay as non-blocking as possible, just for performance, and so that you can handle multiple requests coming in. But that means that you'll have to worry about concurrency. So make sure that if you're accessing variables in like one callback that might be on a background thread, but you're doing something else in the UI thread, make sure that you're using synchronization. Make sure that you're using locking methods. And this is actually really important with the open and closing of the camera. Uh, and it's better if you just go to these two examples that I mentioned, camera two basic and camera two raw. And it shows you how to actually lock the opening and closing of the camera methods so you don't just exit the application and still have hold of the camera. Um, 
Uh, so again, Camera 2 Raw, check that out. Uh, it's a little bit of a brain twister, but it's definitely worth uh, looking at and studying for the right way to um, you know, handle concurrency with Camera 2. All right, we made it, guys. So I know I probably frightened the crap out of you with some of the stuff about Camera 2. And you know, it, it's nice to kind of imagine back when the days of Camera 1 where things were really simple and the method calls were in plain English and you didn't have to worry about concurrency. But, you know, we're moving into kind of the space where, you know, photography is such a huge part of the mobile experience. You know, people are using their phones as their actual cameras. And, you know, kind of the, what comes with that is that you'll probably have users that want to do advanced features, that want to do, you know, kind of more real photography. And that's what Camera 2 is going to be able to give you the tools to accomplish. So, you know, and it's here to stay. Camera 1's getting deprecated, so you'll have to deal with it if you work with camera. But uh, overall, it is a better system. It's a more complicated system, but it's a more powerful one. So if you're interested in camera, don't be afraid to check it out. And that's it. Thanks, guys, for coming. And um, questions? Sure. Have you thought of uh, using like RX Java for doing like callbacks to tell it like, all right, I'm ready. You know, who's ready? You know, like handle the event callback. Like, okay, I'm done with this. I can now let go of the camera. I got the preview. All right, I finished taking the picture, now I have to do an event call today, start with the preview again, stuff like that. I have thought about that. I have not considered it myself, but I think it's it's worth looking at, considering all that. Yeah. I think it's definitely uh, worth looking at. Yeah. So. But no, I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> <laughs> is, is the surface a new construct or no, concept, it's, it's, or is this surface view that's already in the API? Mm -hmm. oh. it's, already, it's already in the API. So, so. I can do OpenGL? Exactly. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, there's actually a class called TextureView, which is um, actually yeah, does OpenGL composition rendering. And it's the, the underlying surface is actually the same thing. So it's just, I yeah. can take a picture and put it in the TextureView and use it. Absolutely. Cool. Actually, um, if you want to do cool things, so the, the thing with surface view is that it's, in a sense, it's actually geared to doing more, um, it's, it's geared to be more performant. Um, whereas Surface or Texture View has all the OpenGL, you can transform it, you can do animations on it, so it's more powerful but uh, less performant. So if you're interested in doing that, that's definitely what Texture View is for. Surface View is more if you aren't <coughs> looking to do crazy things with the image, you just want it to be as efficient as possible. But yeah, uh, it's the same underlying structure in there. Yeah. Cool. Any questions? Is it time to give stuff away? Yeah. All right. Thanks again. Thank you.